In class, in this lesson, we're going to take a look at factoring greatest common factors, and that's what GCF stands for, is greatest common factor. <clears throat> and that means the greatest multiple that they have in common of numbers and variables. So let's actually start over here on the 9z minus 18. And what we're looking at is between 9 and 18, what is the greatest number that goes into both of uh, both 9 and 18. And if you think through your factors, uh, well, 3 goes into both, and 9 goes into both, 1 also goes into both. So the biggest number that goes into both is 9. And so what we do is we want to pull out a 9 from both of them. If I pull out a 9, then I write a parenthesis of what's left over. I say the parentheses are kind of like a refrigerator because it's where you put your leftovers. What you're doing is you're eating a 9, you're pulling out a 9 to eat, and then what's left over? Well, that means I divided by 9. Well, if I divided by 9, then z is left over. Okay? Well, 18 got divided by 9 also, and you're left with a negative 2 because eight, negative 18 divided by 9 is negative 2. This has been factored using the GCF method. Now this next one, the 2y plus 5, I didn't start with it because it actually doesn't have anything in common. The 2 and the 5 don't have any common uh, factors, and the, there, there is no common variable either. So what you could do is, well, first of all, you could leave it alone and say it's, it's prime, or um, there's nothing I can pull out of it. Or you could actually pull out a 1. So you could leave your answer like this with a 1 times 2y plus 5. But there's not very many situations where you actually want to do that. Um, another possibility is eventually we'll see another problem where we want to factor out a negative. I could pull out a negative from both of these, which wouldn't make much sense. But there's different scenarios where it would actually do uh, be a good idea. And so if I divide uh, 2y divided by negative 1, it would turn into negative 2y. Divide the 5 by a negative 1, and that would give me a negative 5. So again... Not very common that I would do that, but it is something that I could actually use as a math technique later. But generally, it suffices to say that this is prime. There's nothing to factor. And the answer for this one was 9z minus 2. Okay, let's try some more examples. If I take a look at this one, I get 12 plus 24z. Now, this time, the variable's on the back end of it. Usually, we like the variable out in front, um, so I could actually rewrite it. Or I could leave it like this. Um, looking at these two numbers, I'm going to notice that I could have 6 go in, I could have 4 go in, um, but the biggest number is 12. That goes in a bowl. So I pull out a 12, and then I open up my refrigerator of what's going to be left over, and I have my 12 divided by 12, which is 1, and then plus 24 divided by 12 is 2. Z. Now, this could be your answer. It just feels really awkward. Usually we have descending order, so I say 12 times 2z plus 1. Okay. Usually we don't have the variables in the back, but if it's given that way, it's all right if your answer is like that. So now looking at this next problem, they both have variables, but they still don't have any variables in common. You have an m and a p. So now you're just looking at the 56 and the 35. And what you'll notice is that if you work through your factors of 56 and 35, you'll see that 7 goes into both. I can divide the 56 and the 35 by 7. And if I do that, 56 divided by 7 should give me 8. And then I bring my m down, so 8m. Plus 35 divided by 7 is 5, so 5p. And so what I did was I divided each number by 7. That 7 went out in front, and then the leftovers, the 8 and the 5, go on the inside of the parentheses. Now in this example, for the first time, we actually have some variables in common. They both have an x. So this time we're going to take that in consideration. But first let's look back at the numbers. 9 and 12, the biggest number they have in common is 3. So when I pull out a 3... I'm also going to need to look at the fact that I have an x in common, so I have 3x. But I, I actually have more than just one x that they have in common. And the way that I tell my students to look at this is that you look for the lowest exponent given, and that's 2. The lowest exponent tells you that that's the greatest amount that they have in common. There's two x's here, there's also two x's in here, and another one. So that's why the 2 is a sure bet of knowing 
uh, the most amount of x I can take out. So I put a 3x squared out in front, and then I write my parentheses for my leftovers. Well, 9 divided by 3 is 3, and then if I have x squared divided by, I'm actually dividing that by x squared, I pulled it all out, so there's none left. And then I put plus 12 divided by 3 is 4. And then x to the third is going to get divided by x squared. In other words, I'm canceling out two of the x's, so 1 is left over, so I write 4x. And then again, the better way to write this final answer would be 3x squared times 4x plus 3. Because we like descending order better. But either answer is fine. Okay. So let's look at another one where we have, again, variables in common. So first thing you want to do is look at the numbers, the 32, the 24, and the 40, and ask yourself, what's the biggest number that they all have in common? And the biggest number they have in common is 8. Um, so the GCF is going to be 8. And then also they're going to have a P in common. But again, I said, look at the lowest exponent here, and the lowest exponent is 3. That means you have p to the third is the biggest amount they have in common. So lowest exponent gives you the biggest amount in common. Now let's say we made a mistake. Okay, and let's say that instead of seeing that it was 8 that we had in common, we said 4, because we saw that 32, 24, and 40 all divis were divisible by 4. So again, the first, I'm just going to show you what would happen if I made a, didn't factor the greatest common factor. Okay, but this is the actual greatest common factor. So let's say I did 4p to the third. Okay. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is to see, show you can see that at the end, I still didn't go far enough. Okay, so you'll notice this when you do it in the lab, that it wouldn't be the right answer. So I do 32 divided by 4, and that would give me 8. If I have 4p's, I take 3 away, I have 1p left. Minus 24 divided by 4. So that should give me 6 p, I'm sorry, not p, because I took 3 p's away, so I don't have any p there, plus 40 divided by 4 would be 10, p to the 5th, I took 3 of them away, so I'd have p to the 2nd. Now, again, the reason why I showed you this example is because, because I took out the 4, and it should have been an 8, you'll notice that the 8, the 6, and the 10 all still have a common factor. 2 goes into all of them. So what happens is you'd have to do one more step of dividing all of these by a 2, and pulling a 2 out in front. And so now, in other words, I'd have to times this by 2, because I need to pull out another 2, which would make this the 8 that you originally should have pulled out, p to the third. And then I'd divide each one of those by that extra 2. So 8 divided by 2 is 4, p. Minus 6 divided by 2 is 3, plus 5, p squared. So this is my real answer had I done it right the first time. Okay, so let me again show you just from the beginning of what it would look like if I did right the first time. So I look at all of them, realize, oh, it's an 8 that actually goes in instead of a 4. So I pull out of my 8, and then p to the third. So then I work through each one of them. 32 divided by 8 is 4, p, because I took 4 minus 3 away. Minus 24 divided by 8 should give me 3, p to the third cancels out. Plus 40 divided by 8 is 5, p squared. Okay. So this is the way you should have done it the first time, but again, the first example I showed was it, it happens very frequently where we didn't pull out the greatest common factor the first time and we're left over and it's not the right answer. So it's okay, you just keep factoring and whatever else you can pull out, you multiply in front. So this time we've got uh, two variables that we're going to have in common. So I'm looking at uh, 24, 18, and 6 first of all, and they all have a 6 in common. So I'm going to pull out my 6 and I'm left with uh, 24 divided by 6, well sorry, let me back up, more than just 6 that I'm pulling out, I'm also pulling out an M and an N. Now I said look for the lowest exponent, well the lowest exponent on the N is a 1, the lowest exponent on M is 2. So I'm going to pull out 6M squared N. Okay. Now I go through and divide each one, so 24 divided by 6 should give me 4, and then I take a look at the m to the third. I'm dividing out 2m, so in other words, m squared. So I'll have 1m left over. I'm taking 1n away, so that means I have 1n left. Okay. So I took the 3 minus the 2, the 2 minus the 1. Okay. Minus, because the negative sign comes down, 18 divided by 6 is 3. 
Now I'm dividing by m squared, so that one's going to cancel. I'm dividing by n, so that n will cancel, so I just have negative 3. Plus, 6 divided by 6 is 1. m to the fourth, I'm taking two of them away, so I have m squared. n to the third, I'm taking one of them away, so I have n uh, squared left over. And that is the correct answer for this problem. So as you can see, I have to think through two variables sometimes rather than just one.